Good evening, friends. Very happy to be here tonight. I just presented with some kind of a present. <laughs> I believe it's a talking machine. Well, I'll, I'll use it a little later on. <laughs> Can you hear me up on the platform or up and around the balcony? Okay. No, I guess maybe I'll have to get this thing around me. <clears throat> Now, is that better? Can you hear up there now, around the side? Oh, that's, that's fine. All right, sir. Well, we'll set this one back. Well, we're happy to be here tonight to greet you again in the name of the lovely Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I am happy tonight that His grace is, extends even to me. And by his grace, I one day came to him, and he saved me from a life of sin and, and gave me the opportunity to preach the gospel to the, his people everywhere, calling them to a life of salvation out of a life of sin. Along with that, he gave me the great privilege of praying for his dear, beloved, sick children. And I'm happy for that opportunity to be here tonight to do that for you. And I'm very sorry, Billy, they come got me a few moments ago and our manager isn't here yet. So I may have to hire somebody sure enough. And at this time, I doubt if Brother, if Brother Tom's here from South Africa will. Tomorrow night, if Brother Moore isn't here, will you give us the message before coming in? All right, that's fine. And it makes the meeting a little hard on me to try to stand up here to, to speak to you and then go ahead with the other service, too. I'm not used to it. It throws me out on the line of praying for the sick and so forth because it's a, it's a dual anointing. It's something different. And um, Brother Toms is a very forceful speaker. I've known him for a long time and since we were in Africa. And I understand that his wife's here. I don't know whether I ever met the sister or not. I hope to get to do that. And Sister Tom's Mrs. Branham is looking for you to come by uh, as soon as the service over and you all come that way. And uh, I want to see that little boy that was named after me, uh, little William. And so we'll probably maybe be able to see before going to Zurich. We've just got one day to leave here and get to Zurich, uh, to New York to go to Zurich. Now, um, tomorrow, the, you know, this is half the meeting is already gone. Would you think of it? This has been one of the shortest long meetings I believe I've ever had so far. It seemed like I just started a couple days ago. You're such a lovely people. Come out at nighttime, sit out in the open air, listen. And, and the manager not here to preach to you and put up with my uh, slobbering and going on. You know, I eat a lot of new grapes out of Canaan, and it causes you to slobber a whole lot, you know. <laughs> so, uh, trying to take his place and so forth and then hold the prayer lines and it certainly makes it kind of hard. So you pray for us and tonight I'll try just to speak a few moments to get lined up with the meeting, just the feel of the Spirit and where it's all seated at and then I'll, I'll, I will form a prayer line and start praying for the sick. And I just wonder while we're speaking this way, don't you think that one night we ought to just come in and, and usually when uh, come in of a night time and not to discern, but just line up everybody's got prayer cards and pray for them. And um, I think that would give everybody a, a good chance to get into the prayer line as once as cards are holding them. And we just have to take a few each time and, and these kind of lines. And then to give everybody an opportunity to come and, and be and be in the prayer line. And soon we're looking for something to happen that when I'll be able then to just go and pray for the people right out. If you only knew, my dear beloved friend, what it is to go through what you do under a vision, I brought it on myself. It's not, not I don't operate it myself, but it come on. I just, the people rallied for it and I kept going and now I can't even hold a meeting without it, hardly. But if you only knew what you go through with, just imagine going into another world 
back down the line, 30, 40 years in somebody's life, looking at somebody, and you know your voice is coming in here at Macon, Georgia, yet you're away somewhere else in maybe some other nation. <clears throat> you know, Daniel had one vision, he's troubled at his head for many days. Just think, one vision. See? And uh, you don't realize what that is. And there's no way to explain it. You just have to believe that that's all. Someone asked me, he said, why is it you get weak when you get off the platform? <clears throat> it isn't while I'm standing here that I feel weak. It isn't after a mile from under that I feel weak. It's between the two places. And it, that's just when you're coming out of it. Of course, it's hard to explain that, but if you read the Bible, you'll see that it's true. It's, it's absolutely true. So now, tonight, uh, coming over, I uh, thought well, maybe if Brother Moore, Billy said he wasn't here, so I'm... Just got a little text of scripture here that I might read, if God willing, and talk to you just for a few moments to kind of get the crowd settled down. And on the thoughts of the Bible, see, after all, whatever I say is just a man. And now uh, whatever God says, that's God. Mine, will, mine can fail because I'm just a man. But what he says is the truth, and it won't fail. And now, like... The vision, what is that? Yes, sir, that's the word of the Lord. But it's secondarily. If it's contrary to this year and the word, then it's wrong. See, it has to be. Now, here is the word of God to the whole world, the foundation, the plan of salvation, everything. This is in the word. But as an individual who did something or something they might not have done and should have done, now, a vision or a word from God is absolutely the word of God to them. But it must line up with this Bible. If it doesn't, it's not of God. So I'm so thankful. And these, uh, ever since I can remember as a little boy, visions come to me, just a little baby boy. The first thing I can remember was a vision. When I was born in the city of Kentucky, he told me I'd live in Indiana near a city called New Albany. I've lived in three, three miles of it all my life. And I wasn't but 18 months old when the vision came. And the very time when I was born, that angel that you see on the picture here was hanging over the little crib bed where I was born. In. And my people, of course, formerly, the beginning, are Catholic. We, they immigrated from Ireland to come here. And um, then but my father and mother didn't go to any church at all. And they were raised up in the mountains. My father, a logger. And when that light came in that morning at 6 o'clock on April the... Uh, April the 6th, 1909, and that light hung over that little crib bed there, a little trundle bed. I don't know what you all know where a trundle bed is or not. Straw tick, a shuck pillow. How many ever seen a shuck pillow or a straw tick? Well, would you look? <laughs> I, I'm not the only country boy around here. <laughs> There's just plenty of us. Well, Ma, that's mighty fine. I feel like I could come without a towel now. <laughs> <laughs> that's just fine. Well, that's my mother like scared her to death. My dad, my mother was 15 years old. My dad was 18. Just kidding. And so, since then, there it's been. Nothing, nothing that I had, nothing that I merited. It's not just a little gift that God gave, sovereignly gave. That's the only way they are given, is by the sovereign grace of God. And now. Let us turn to his word and read just a few moments, be reverent, and we know that God will add his blessing to his word. Now, over in the Old Testament, I love to go to the Old Testament because it's a type of the new, a shadow of the things that's to come. And now, if I speak just a little long, will you pinch me on the leg or something here, brother, and let me know that I've spoke too long because I want to try to pray for everybody I can before leaving Georgia. My first time in your state, I sure fell in love with you. Your first night here, you're just such a welcome feeling. I don't say that because you're here. If I'd say that just because it's in your presence, I'd be a hypocrite. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't have to say that. I say it because I mean it from my heart. You're very nice. And now in Genesis 22, 7, we read a portion of Scripture, and then... Um, they read uh, some of the 14th verse also. 7th, 8th, and 14th we'll make it. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, 
my father? And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they both went on together. Now in the 14th verse we read this. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now shall we bow our heads just a moment while we speak to the author of this word? Our Heavenly Father, we come to approach Thee in the all-sufficient name of the Lord Jesus, knowing this first, that He's promised to hear us and give us a hearing when we ask in His name. Now Thou hast said that wherever two or three are gathered in Your name, the name of the Lord Jesus, You would be in our midst. So we know beyond a shadow of doubt that You're here tonight. And we pray now that you'll give us a few words, Lord, and encourage us tonight, Lord, from thy word. And we pray now, not knowing why, that Brother Moore hasn't showed up in all these nights. And I pray, Father, that you'll help him and bless him wherever he is. And I ask your blessings upon all that are unsaved tonight. May something be said or done here tonight that will cause the unsaved to believe you and receive you, the backslider to come back, those outside of Christ to be baptized into the body of believers. And may every sick person here tonight, Lord, every one that cancer is, TB, whatever it might be, may they be perfectly whole tonight. And may there not be a feeble person left among us. May every crippled person walk out without crutch or support. May those old cots rise up and walk. And may the Lord Jesus just throw out his arms of power and grip every heart in such a way that they'll know that he's here granting these blessings. And when we leave tonight, may we say like those who came from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us because of his presence? For we ask it in his name. Amen. Now, in the speaking of the reading, setting forth of the scripture tonight, we're speaking on Abraham, and in the book of Genesis, God gave or appeared to Abraham in five or seven compound redemptive names. One of those names was Jehovah Jireh, the one that we have under consideration tonight. Then he was Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide a sacrifice. Jehovah Rapha, Lord the healer, and the shield, the buckler, and so forth, on down, are the compound redemptive names. The night in the discussion at Houston, Texas, when this angel picture was taken, many of you have heard the story, perhaps, of how it happened about. We were having a lovely meeting in Houston, and uh, sponsored there by many of the churches, and a certain minister said that wrote a piece in the paper and said that I was a religious imposter and imposing myself as a servant of God, and I ought to be run out of town, and he'd like to be the one to do it. So uh, he challenged me to a debate on the scripture, said that I could not support divine healing by the scriptures. Well, Mr. Bosworth was managing that meeting, and here he come in the room, you know, real excited, said, Looky here, Brother Branham, looky here. Said, call his, call his hand, and I said, Now look, Brother Bosworth, all the fussing you could do with that man, he'd walk away with the same belief he had when he come in. You don't get nothing by fussing. Jesus didn't come to fuss, he just done what the Father told him. If they believe it, all right. If they didn't, all right, anyhow. So... Uh, after all, if God confirms the word, Jesus said, if you can't believe me, well, I believe the works I do. It's the Father sent me. And he said, uh, but Brother Bosworth said, but Brother Branham, he said, I'll tell you, he said, I, I, I think you ought to take that up. <laughs> now I said, oh, no, Brother Bosworth. Just let it alone. I said, look, we're having about 8,000 people now, and there's about 7,000 of them want to be prayed for, and give one of the nights to fuss with that preacher. And the only thing, you go away. I said, if he's born to an unbeliever, 
God made him an unbeliever, and how are you going to be anything else but an unbeliever? I said, God predestinated a man, man of old, was foreordained to this condemnation. I said, the Bible said so. So if they can't believe, just like pouring water from a duck's back, they can't believe. They ain't got nothing to believe with. And I said, then, you never heard a man who's ever born again of the Spirit of God say such a remark as that. I said, because he's got God in him, and he believes all things. What God wrote, he just believes it. But I said, now, if the man don't believe, so just let him alone. And he said, uh, next day he put in the paper and said, it shows what they're made out of because they're afraid to preach divine healing in the light of God's Word. That was too much for Brother Bosworth. He said, Brother Brennan, if you won't do it, let me do it. <laughs> well, 80 years old. And I thought, my, I looked at him, I thought of Caleb, you know, saying, let me take this city, you see. And I said, Brother Bosworth, that man's just out of the cemetery, or seminary, excuse me, <laughs> Not the same way. <laughs> so I said, Brother Bosworth, I, I said, Brother Bosworth, that, that, you're 80 years old nearly, and that man's just about 35 years old. He said, that doesn't have anything to do with the Word of God. He said, will you let me do it? And I said, no, Brother Bosworth, no. Don't fuss with him. Just let him blow it, toot his own horn, and go on. And he said, well, Brother Branham, he said, you know, to the public, I feel like I just like to, to show him that he's wrong. He said, if you let me do it, I promise you I won't fuss one bit. So I said, well, all right, go ahead. And down the stairs he went to the reporter, you know, and, and so he, he told him. And then the next day, great headlines, the ecclesiastical fur will fly. You can, you can imagine how the paper printed, you know. So here they said, and that goes to show I seen something that night that will make me believe that someday all born-again Christians will be one. I don't care they fuss down there like they do everywhere else. One's the Trinitarian, the one's the Unitarian, the other's the oneness and the twoness and the fiveness and all these ups and downs and scruples and their baptisms and so forth, all these things. But that night, when they come, 20 or 30,000 packed in the auditorium. They didn't care whether it's oneness or threeness or drinking a, from one fountain, two fountain, or riding one hump camel, two, three, or four, or five hump camel. There was one thing on stake, and that was divine healing. They all believe it, and here they come by trains, planes, and everything. Packed out the big Sam Houston Coliseum. And so I wasn't going down, because I just don't like to hear people fussing around the Word of God. So that night, something kept telling me, go down. So a couple of policemen come, got me, and I went out, went way up in balcony 30. And so then when they got started, well, they come out there, and so... Um, Actually, he wanted Mr. Bosworth to take the first part. So Mr. Bosworth said, Well, I have written here um, a 600 questions, 600 scriptures, that proves that Christ's present attitude towards the sick is just the same as it was the days that he was here on earth. And God has never changed in his attitude towards the sick. And if Mr. Best here can take one of these scriptures and disprove it by the Bible, there'll be no debate. I'll just sit down. So Mr. Best kept saying, I'll take care of that when I get up there. He said, I'll ask you one question. If you'll answer me yes or no, I'll sit down and give you the rest of it. He said, was the redemptive names of Jehovah applied to Jesus, yes or no? <laughs> that settled it. <laughs> that was all. <laughs> if it wasn't, then he wasn't the Savior. He wasn't Jehovah Jireh. And if he was, he was Jehovah Rapha, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he put an answer. So when he got up, he preached a pretty good Camelite sermon. That's right. Just talking about the resurrection when this mortal puts on immortality and divine healing would be in the millennium when we're immortal. I don't get it. <laughs> so uh, now he said it was a Baptist sermon. I was rocked in a Baptist cradle. I know what Baptists believe. But it was no, was no Baptist doctrine connected with it. And then afterwards he kept saying, Bring on that divine healer. Let me see him heal somebody. Now let me see him. He can work them up in their psychology and so forth. And let me see him in a year from today. And I'll tell you whether they're healed or not. Bring that divine healer forward. Mr. Bosworth said, aren't you ashamed to say that? So he knew I was up there. So he said, now, if the debate is settled, he said, all right. So now, if Brother Branham wishes to come down and dismiss the audience that I know is here, but he don't have to. So my brother was standing by me and he said, so now you said still, I said, well, ain't I said still? And so my wife was standing there, you know, and he said, now you ain't going down there. I said, I never said a word about going. And so I was setting way up. And so he said, now, if he wants to come, and about that time I heard something go, that circle of light come down. 
I don't care who says anything, man, and that settles it. Uh, I said, raised up, and Howard said, sit down. My wife said, look at there, Howard. So my brother sat down. About 500 ushers put their hands together. I made a line come up to the platform. I said, I'd like to shake hands with Mr. Best. I said, don't know one thing hard of him. I said, we got boys over in Korea fighting that we can have freedom of religion. Free. I said, I don't believe is what he believes. But I said, I'm different with him in theology, but after all, this is America. He's got a right to believe what he wants. I said, I don't know you think hard of him because his mother loves him the same as mine does me. I said, now, I was reminded of when he kept saying, bring that healer for us, the same spirit that said, come off the cross and we'll believe you. Christ saw visions, and one day they put a rag around his head and hit him on the head and said, now if you're a prophet, tell us who hit you and we'll believe you. I said, that's the same spirit, but... I said, I'm sorry that her brother's anointed with it, but I said, now as far as healing anybody, I said, I, I don't claim to heal anybody. I said, if preaching divine healing makes me a divine healer, then preaching salvation makes you a divine savior. So I said, only preach it by the word. That's all. And I said, now as far as the vision, God speaks for his gifts. I said, that, that's the question. And about that time when he said that, the angel of the Lord come afar for us. I made a great big world, and here he come down to the building like that, coming down. People again scream, and I said, he speaks now. I said, if I tell the truth, God's obligated to speak for me. And if I don't tell the truth, God will have nothing to do with a lie. You know that. And just then, here he comes. And they took the picture of it there, and he took it down to the, the Douglas Studios, shot the picture of it, took it down. A Catholic boy took the picture, and a Jew. And so they went out to the studios to... Look it over, and he said, I don't believe it. Sure, I believe it. Just, we just imagine that, too, because everybody's pointing to it and so forth. But when he tucked it down and pulled it out of the acid, and he was up there to take Mr. Bosworth's picture, and when Mr. Bass was holding a debate with him, he pulled like this and put his finger under Brother Bosworth's nose and said, take it like this. He said, I want them to hang up in my, I want to take that old man and skin him and take his skin and tack it on my study door for a memorial to divine healing. Could you imagine a brother talking about one like that? So... He said, and that night when he put his finger under his nose and he drew his fist up and had the studio to set that big camera out, to, or several cameras there, so to take the picture, well then, you know what happened? God wasn't willing that his servant should be taken with a picture like that, and every one of them was blank. Not a one of them showed up. But the one you pull this other one out, that was a picture of the angel of the Lord on it. And they sent it to uh, George J. Lacey, FBI fingerprinting document. He kept it in the place for several days, and then it was copyrighted in Washington, D.C. as the only supernatural being that's ever been scientifically proven. And that's right, in Washington, D.C., now copyrighted. And then they come and said, we'll give the analysis of it. Mr. Lacey said, whose name's Reverend Branham? I said, mine. He said, stand up. And I stood up, kind of a red-headed fellow, kind of hard-ball-like. I hope he's not sitting in prison to hear this. <laughs> so... He had hair hanging down his eyes when he seen it first. He was very hard about it. He said, Reverend Bennett, come here. He said, you're a guy like all men do. See? I said, I'm sure of that, but I'm prepared for it. <laughs> he said, but as long as there's a civilization, your picture will never go out of existence. He said, that's the only time a supernatural being was ever photographed. He said, the light struck the lens. It's the truth, like that. And he submitted to me, and I give it over to the Douglas Studios in Houston, Texas. They're the ones that own it. And he said some little thing there to me, something said, the testament unto the testator, something said, well, as long as you're living, that picture will never be enforced, but afterwards, that wait till you're gone, it'll be on 10 cent stores and things like that. So what it is, is what it is to me, if I, if this is my last night on earth, if this is my last night to be on earth, my testimony is the truth. The church knows it, millions around the world. I've come in personal contact with guessing more than 10 million people. And around the world. It's been seen by thousands times thousands of people everywhere. I trusted God that it will come visible here in Macon before I leave, before the audience. And they see the works and signs of it. That's the truth. And the scientific world can't say there's no supernatural being anymore because it's scientifically proven. God here without an excuse now. So we are thankful to the Lord tonight to know that our great Jehovah God was with the father Abraham, is still here tonight with his church moving on just the same as he was in the days gone by. To my opinion, the same pillar of fire that led the children of Israel, Jesus Christ, the angel of the covenant, the same yesterday, today, and forever.
scientifically proven. Now, Abraham, to speak for, about him for about ten minutes or so, Abraham was come down with his father from in the land of Chaldee and the Shinar Valleys and dwelled in the city of Ur. They came out of Babylon, the people did after the Babylon was first called the Gates of Paradise, later called Confusion because languages was broken up there. Abraham, after coming down into this land of Chaldee and the city of Ur, Abraham was no more than anyone else. I want you to notice this tonight, Christian, and get this real good and deep, that God called his people by sovereign election. God only called by election. It isn't he that willeth or he that runneth, it's God that showeth mercy. And every man and woman here that ever had God that touches their heart ought to be ashamed if they never heeded to the call. And there's many people in the world today that that gone and passed the line of conscience and will never, never come to God. But God called Abraham not because he was good, but because God chose Abraham. Jesus said, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Jesus said, No man can come to the Father or come to me except my Father draws him first. Why are you out here tonight? It's because you're interested. Why aren't you at the ball game? It's because you love God more than you love ball game. That's the reason you're here. God calls you to put a different desire in your heart. Now, the election of God. God calls man by sovereign election. Do you notice it? I wish we had time to go into details. When you go to talk about the Word, the Holy Spirit just starts getting it right. That's wonderful. Abraham was election. Isaac was justification. Jacob was grace. But Joseph was perfection. See, as you get them moving, and Abraham being called, God saw Abraham and called him the sovereign grace and election and told him, Separate yourself from your people and among your kindred, and I'll bless you. You know, it's the day that God always calls a separation. People today, when you're choosing your pastors, usually people today want mixtures. I don't know how it is with you people down in here, but up in the north, the people want mixtures. All we want to sell us a good sport. We want somebody that can, or a Stand in the pulpit and can, or he wouldn't hurt if he did a little things on the sides, you know, just so he can mix with all crowds. People want mixers, but God wants separators. The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Paul and Barnabas. There are some people in choosing their pastors today, get a six footer with shoulders about so wide, black wavy hair to present, make itself dressed in a tuxedo suit and everything in the estrogen or suit or something other than a platform because it's a psychological effect. God don't care an ounce for that. Listen. Listen to the scriptures. God told Samuel one time, said, go up and anoint one of Jesse's sons to be king. Jesse thought the same thing as a modern thinker believes today. He said his great big son out there a six Footer, you know, with his black shiny hair, said, My, what, what, he'll look like a real king. Good, big, husky fella, fine looking fella, and said, Look what he'll look with a robe on him, a big gold crown sitting on the side of his head. And Samuel got to all the Lord said, But I've refused him. Right. No matter how six foot he was and how striking he looked, God said, I've refused him. So he brought the next biggest one down and showed him. God said, I refused him too. And he went on to he showed the sixth one. Then he said, Here, have you got another one? He said, Yeah, I got a little old scrawny, ruddy looking fellow out there in the sheep pen out there or somewhere taking care of the sheep. But I'm sure he'll never make a king. Well, go get him. And as soon as David came forth, a little ruddy fellow, stooped shoulders perhaps, with a little sheep coat around him, Samuel ran and poured the oil on him. He said, This is the king. That's God's choice. Amen. 
Man looked on the outside, but God looked on the heart. Sometimes you get a great big church, a lot of crosses and statues around it, and plush seats and a ten thousand dollar organ in it. That don't attract God. Sometimes there's more salvation, a little mission down on the corner, and you just poke into the place. That's right. Man looks to the outside, but God looks at the heart. Always remember that. Now, Abraham called out of the land of shouting. God met him down there. Probably a little fellow, 75 years old, when God called him. Probably a little bitty fellow, long whiskers, bald headed, and soup shoulders. But God found grace. Abraham never found grace in the sight of God, and God sure called him by election. Amen. True heart. Someone that would follow him, would listen to him. And he had a wife, 65 years old. He told Abraham, said, Now, separate yourself from among your people. That's the best thing to do. Come out from among us. Get away from it. Someone said, Well, I still go to the pool room. I think maybe I can win some of the boys. Stay out of the pool room. Stay off the devil's ground. Right. You'll never do it that way. Separate yourself and show your color. Be a Christian. Act like it. Live like it. Talk like it. People will believe it. Notice, Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Lift him up in your life, in your living, what you do. Then God called Abraham, and he separated himself from his people to go into a strange land. Isn't it strange when God calls a man, he calls him from among his associates to dwell among strange people speaking strange languages. Kind of strange how God does that, isn't it? But he still does it. Come out. You don't talk like the old crowd no more. You come over into a crowd out there where you are hooping and hollering and carrying off for the devil. You're shouting and praising the Lord in this other crowd. You have to go amongst the strange people. Separate yourself from the crowd you once associated with. How God in his mercy called him. And he said, Abraham, I know you're an old man now. You're, you're 75 years old, Sarah's 65. But I'm going to bless you and give you a baby. And out of this baby, the whole world's going to be blessed. All nations are going to be blessed for this baby. Now, Abraham never wondered about it. He just simply took God at his word. I like that. Just take God at his word. And he went out all testifying that the baby was going to be born. I can imagine seeing getting everything ready, buying up all the diapers and the pins and everything, getting ready for the baby. Nothing wrong, Sarah said, how you feel the first week? No difference. First month passed, how you feel, Sarah? No difference. Well, glory to God, we're going to have it anyhow. First year passed, how you feeling, Sarah? No difference. Well, praise the Lord, we're going to have it anyhow. He took God at his word regardless of circumstance. He said, God said so, no matter how you feel or what about it, we're going to have it anyhow. God said so. Amen. If we be the children of Abraham, we've got to have that kind of faith, regardless of what symptoms says. God's word, we look at the unseen, what God says about us. So many people rely on symptoms. Oh, if I could look, but my hand is just a little straighter. If I felt just a little better with my stomach trouble, if my head had quit hurting, that has nothing to do with it. Go right on glorifying God, testing about that. Things that you don't even feel or see or taste, they are here. Believe it anyhow. Well, uh, you tell about, well, there's a man by the name of Jonah had the worst symptoms I ever seen. He was backslid first. That's right. He does something God told him not to do. And he's on a stormy sea, caused a lot of trouble. Had his hands and feet tied, filled out, and a big whale swallowed him and went down to the bottom of the sea. Now, uh, you talk about some symptoms. That fit in his heart, and in the belly of a whale, seaweed wrapped around his neck, and anybody knows when a fish feeds and he eats his belly full, he goes right to the bottom and rests his swimmers on the bottom. Feed your goldfish and see if they don't do it. Goes right down to the bottom, and it's probably 40 fathoms deep there, and here this preacher was, back slid, and his hands tied behind him, in the belly of a whale, in the bottom of the sea, and it's a big storm up at the top. You talk about symptoms. He looked this way, it was whale's belly. He looked back that way, it was whale's belly. Everywhere he looked, it was whale's belly. And he had some symptoms. But you know what he said? They're lying vanities. I don't believe a one of them. He 
says, Once more I allow look to your holy temple. Not to the holy valley, but to your holy temple. You can't hide a saint from his prayer. Right. I want did nobody hear that bad off tonight. That's right. But he said, Once more will I look to your holy temple, Lord. For he knew when Solomon dedicated that temple, he prayed. And he said, Lord, if our people be in trouble anywhere and look toward this holy place and pray, then hear from heaven. And he believed the prayer of Solomon. And if Jonah, under those conditions, could believe the prayer of Solomon under a temple that was dedicated here on earth, how much more ought we to believe tonight by our resurrected Lord Jesus sitting at the right hand of God with his own blood, breaking in his passion for his own contention? Refuse to see any symptoms and say there are lying vanities and walk away from it. Oh, man. Don't pay attention to circumstances. What God says is the truth. Not what you see, what you believe. Jesus never said, did you see it? He never did say, did you believe it? Or, I, I beg your pardon, never said, did you feel it? He said, did you believe it? That's it. So you act on what you believe, not what you see. Not what, just what you believe. And if you believe God will keep his word, then go acting like it. Take him at his word and go ahead. Then you're going to get somewhere. I know it's the truth. I've trusted it, brother, in the hours of death, and I know it's the truth. If it worked for me, it worked for Abraham, it worked for Jonah, it'll work for you. Just take him at his word and believe it. And Abraham refused to see any symptoms of Sarah not having this baby. All they told him is a little off at the head. Now, you'd imagine what a doctor would say today of an old man 75 or 80 years old going down and say, well, here's my wife, she's 70 and I'm 80, and we're going to have a baby. <laughs> they say the old man's a little cracked in the head. Sure, they did then. They would now. But Abraham wasn't cracked in the head. He took God at his word. That makes a difference. And God honored him for it, too. I can see him as he goes on. He said, Lord, will you give me a... How will you confirm this to me? And he took him up there that day. I wish we had time to get into it. It's time to quit now. But I wish we had time to get into all those things to bring this up to this little point. But we'll jump and hit a few high places. Look out there that day. When he told him he would confirm it, and what type was to Abraham? He killed that little heifer of three, and the sheep of three, and the goat of three, and he cut them apart, and he put a turtle down, and a young pigeon there, set the birds off of them, and the evening time, or when the sun went down, watch what happened first. A real deep sleep fell over Abraham, showing Abraham... Now, I made a covenant with Adam. Adam, if you'll do, I'll take you in partners with him. If you'll do certain things, I'll do certain things. And Adam broke his promise. Man always breaks his promise. But Abraham, this is not what if you do. This is what I'm going to do. This is my covenant with you. Amen. Unconditionally. Oh, brother. If you ever see that, your eyes will come from open. <laughs> right. It's not what you've done. It's what God did for you in Christ. That's right. Nothing of yours is what he done. And there he said, Abraham, put Abraham to sleep to show that he, he had nothing to do into it. Now, Abraham, you haven't got one thing to do into it. And then before him went a horrible darkness, showing death, every man through the valley of shadow of death. Beyond that was a smoking furnace. Every man deserves to go to hell. But beyond that went a little white light. And that little light went right between each one of those covenant, uh, each one of those beasts like that, everyone that was cut together, each one of the sacrificial beasts except the turtle dove and the pigeon. Now, if you'll notice, the turtle dove and pigeon, the reason it wasn't cut apart, because the turtle dove and pigeon represents divine healing. The covenant was broke from great, from law to grace, but the covenant of healing lasts always, from always through. There's no cutting it apart at all. Right. Now, he made the covenant. And notice, he went between those, proving, showing to Abraham what through his seed he would do Christ Jesus in the years to come. They didn't make a covenant to Christ to the Gentiles for every man in the world. Everybody that would come, this covenant would be, it's with you tonight. Unconditionally, if you become a Christian, every redemptive blessing of God belongs to you. It's your personal property. You've got a right to claim it. If you let Satan push you over the corner, well, that's up to you. But brother, stand up there 
went toe to toe with this scripture say it is written. That's right. That's why your Lord did it. Any man, I don't care, you might be a weak Christian. You don't need people coming to you with gifts of healing. You don't need these things. The only thing you need is take God at his word and stand toe to toe with Satan. You'll defeat him on the ground. Jesus brought it down to that picture. When he was Satan said, if thou be the Son of God, do this. Jesus said, it's written. Man shall not live by bread alone. He took him somewhere else and said, if thou be the Son of God, cast yourself down. Perform a miracle here before me. That spirit still lives, you know. Let me see you do it. I'll believe it. You jump off this building here and show me you can do it, and I'll believe you're the Son of God. He said, Satan, it is written. Right on the word of God. Took him up on the mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. Said, these belong to me. So you see where the kingdoms of the world belong to? He said, I, these belong to me. I'll do with them what I want to. If you'll worship me, I, I'll, I'll give them all to you. He said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And he kept throwing the scriptures in and defeated Satan with the Father's word. And any man or woman tonight, if you're here sick and needy, stand toe to toe with Satan and say, it's written by his stripes I'm healed. And stay with it. Watch what happens. There'll be a difference around making here with the sick folks. Take God at his word. He'll do it. Now in this covenant, when he made the covenant with Abraham there, I notice in the Old Testament, now when we make a covenant with one another here in America, how do we do it? We walk out and shake one another's hand. Say, just shake on that. That's the way we make a covenant. Down in Japan, when they make a covenant, they take a little salt and pitch it on one another. Like that to make the covenant. But in the Orient, how they make a covenant, they kill a beast. And they stand between this feast, the pieces of the dead body, and they write out their covenant, whatever they made, sign their name to it. They tear it in half, give it to one man, the other man keeps the other half. And then they take an oath over this dead beast's body. If either one of them breaks this covenant, let them be as a dead beast. And that's what God was showing that he was going to do in the days to come. That when God came down here on earth in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ, walked among men, and he was taken to Calvary and tore apart. And God taken the body up to his right hand and sent down the Holy Ghost upon the church. And when we come together again, then pieces, just like the old covenant, got the tell tale one with the other. And if you ever go in the rapture, you're going to have to have the same spirit in you that was on Jesus Christ. Amen. That's God's covenant with his church. Amen. Don't you take a cold, formal handshake. You take a heartwarming experience from God of being born again. Don't care where you belong. Yes, sir. Because God, remember, when these two met together, if these didn't dovetail, it was sold out. It had to be the same thing. And the same spirit was up on Christ has to be on the church. God taking the body of Christ and set it on his right hand. The power above. And he sent the Holy Ghost back. And it's going around looking out the church, and when they come together, it has to be the same body, same signs, same wonders, same baptisms, same signs and wonders, same gospel. Amen. Right. Notice when he made the covenant, and he confirmed it there. Later on, Abraham went on. Glory to God, and after that experience, he really had the victory then. He got to be 99 years old, almost 100. God appeared to him in the name of of the Almighty God. The word comes from the word, the Hebrew word El Shaddai, which means the breast, the bosom of a woman. El Shaddai, the Almighty, the strength giver, the nourisher, like the mother to the baby. When the little baby is threatened and sick, the mother pulls it up to her bosom and it nurses her strength and her life into it. And another thing it does, it means he's a satisfier. While the little baby is nursing, it's satisfied by it's nursing. It ain't well yet, but it's satisfied as long as it's a drawing from the mother. And God is El Shaddai, the bosom. Not one breast, two breasts. He was wounded for our transgression. With his stripes we were healed. He is God of our strength for spiritual. He's God of our strength for our physical. And no matter which one you need of it, move up to the breast tonight and take a hold of it. God's word and go to mercy of it. Tommy's a hurting. 
It's all right as long as he's nursing to mammy. Now I'm telling you, a believer that wants to take the hold of God's eternal word for a promise, if anything come or go, he's satisfied he's laying right there, nursing away, pulling the strength right out of God. By his stripes we were healed. Wounded for our transgressions, with his stripes we were healed. Pulling down the blessings of God. Satisfied as he's laying there. Come by and say, you don't look any better. Say, glory to God, he healed me. Amen. Stay right with us. Say, you ain't got the Holy Ghost. That's what you think. Amen. If you was only pulling from where I am, you'd think you had a tune. That's right. Amen. I'm El Shaddai, the Almighty, and he is still El Shaddai, the Almighty God, the pacifier to the saints. If the saint is sick, if he can hear the word of God correctly, if he's the seed of Abraham, we are being the seed of Abraham. When we are dead in Christ, we take on Abraham's seed in our heirs according to the promise. But first you got to be dead in Christ, born to the Holy Ghost. The same Holy Ghost that led Abraham back there leads you then. Then you believe like Abraham. What God said is truth. And nothing else but words. Don't care what anybody else says, what the bishop says, or what the pope says, or what anybody else says. If God's word says it, that's truth to the believers and Abraham's children. The covenant's to you. When you're circumcised, Abraham is circumcised by flesh as a confirmation. You're circumcised the heart for the Holy Ghost as a confirmation. Oh, my, I feel religious right now. <laughs> I feel like I can almost shout too. You know, Baptists shout also. Yes, they do. When they get right down to God, they really get into it. Notice, brothers. Nursing from the breast of Almighty God, the nurser, the, the life giver, our mother, our father, the nurse father. My, my, what a, what a picture we got here. Wish we could stay with it longer, but we have to hurry on. Anyhow, after the little baby was born, little Isaac, as God promised, they was a hundred years old. The baby was born. Think of it. Got to hit another little point here. Might take if you'll forgive me for taking your time. It's just a little encouragement to you. You might not agree with this at first, but you look it all over. This will give you something to do tomorrow in, in your spare time. Look this over in the Bible. Now, when Abraham, when Lot took his choice and went out to the plains down there in Sodom and Gomorrah, we realize how he was a lukewarm believer and what happened to Lot. But God never did bless Abraham until he fully separated himself from Lot. Lot kept hanging on as a hair in the soup, and he, he just absolutely couldn't go on. And that's what's the matter today. We got little old Lot hanging around, and the reason that we can't go on with God. Somebody, one of the church members, says, "Well, if he preaches out, I'll get out of here." <laughs> that's put the hair out of the soup and go on. That's the only thing to do. Preach the gospel, Amen. Regardless if you have to preach it four posts, I'd rather lay on my stomach and drink branch water and eat soda crackers and preach the true word of God than eat fried chicken every day and ride in a Cadillac. Amen. I'd rather do it and know that you're right in the sight of God. Amen. I don't say that for a joke. This is no place for joking. I don't believe in joke, but that's the truth. Amen. Now, I want you to notice, then when this angel came down, God himself, did you notice Abraham talked to God in a body? A physical body, have dust on his clothes, eat the meat of a calf, drink the milk from the cow, eat some cornbread that Sarah baked in there. God himself, what did he do? He knew he was going to be made flesh sometimes. So way back here to prove to Abraham, he just jumped up a bunch of cows and a bunch of, of atoms and sewed them together and lived in that body. Come right down and had an appetite. Amen. Abraham called him the Lord. That's right. He was. And as soon as he told Abraham what was going to happen, he vanished. Sarah laughed when she thought she was nearly 100 years old. We're going to have a baby. 100 years old and going to have a baby. Could you imagine that? Now, brethren, let's say we all know that the Sarah gave birth to the baby. We'll all admit that. Look what God did. Now, here's some encouragement for all of us old folks. Now, I want you to notice this. What it is, and to you young ones, it's coming on to get old one of these days. Watch what God did there. I was up on a lake here about six years ago when that revelation came to me, and I'll tell you, they thought they had the Salvation Army out there. <laughs> oh, my, that was the noisiest guy they ever heard in their life. Now, i tell you what, what God did. If you notice real close to the Bible, is this, that's where preachers miss it. That's where these big schools miss it. See, the 
Bible is wrote between the lines. The Bible said, uh, Jesus, the uh, scripture claims, I have hid it from the eyes of the wise and prudent, and will reveal it to babes such as will learn. See? It's between the lines. I got a little girl tonight I married a few years ago. She's the mother of my three children. And she can write me a letter. She says, Dear Bill, I'm sitting here tonight thinking of you, and I'm praying with you. Now, that's what she says on the letter. But between the lines, I love her and she loves me, so I know what she's talking about. See, I read between the lines. And if you want to really read the Bible with a spiritual understanding, get in love with the writer. Amen. Then you can read between the lines. See where God pulls it out. Notice, I can see a fair little grandma, you know, great, 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 great grandma, 100 years old, really, little dust cap on, little shawl over her shoulders, walking on a cane. And you know what? Something happened. Now, you know it would be hard for that woman to give birth to a baby. Anyone knows that. The first thing, Abraham had lived with her since she was about 17 years old. And she was about 45 years of past menopause. Now, the impossible. But notice. Abraham, the longer it went, the stronger he got. Now, today, if you get prayed for tonight, the more you ain't perfectly well, you say, well, there ain't got to the end of divine healing. I ever got it. Then you're not a child of Abraham. That's right. Because Abraham, the older he got, the greater miracle is going to be, so he was strong, giving praise to God, said Romans 4. The longer it went, the more blessing it would be. The more miracle it would be. longer it took. So Abraham just kept getting stronger and stronger, giving glory to God. As his shoulders went down and down, he kept giving more praise to God. Here's Sarah. Now, we know that God would have to make her womb fertile. We know that. Now, you're a mixed audience. You listen to a doctor. I'm your brother. Look. He'd have to make her womb fertile because she was 45 or 50 years of past menopause. Think of it. When she's a young girl and healthy and everything, then she didn't have babies. But here now, she's Nearly 50 years of past menopause, and now she's going to have the baby. Now, it has to make her womb fertile. And besides that, if he is going to, she's going to go, they didn't have cesareans in those days, you know. So in, have, in order to give birth to that baby to go in labor, she's going to have to have a new heart put in her. Of course, an old woman that old couldn't stand labor pain, you know that. All right. Then she's going to have to go in labor, so she'll have to have another heart. And in order to do that, the milk veins are dried up, so they just have to have new milk veins put in. Now, you God don't patch up anything like that. What God did to say, he turned her back to a young woman. Now, that kind of struck you a little bit, but just hold on now. Don't, don't jump up and run. See? Let's, let's hold on just a minute. He turned Abraham and Sarah both back to about 25 years old, like he's going to do everybody one of these days. It's his children. He showed in them what he was going to do to him and his seed. After him. Notice, Sarah and Abraham immediately took a trip and went plumb to go in her on camels. Followed, take it over the mountain, see how far it is, about 300 miles. Quite a trip for an old couple like that, don't you think? 100 years old, little grandma on her shawl, running along like this, and Abraham with his beard hanging way down. My. Went on down with a 300 mile trip, and above everything, there was a young king by her named Emily. And he was looking for a sweetheart. And all those pretty girls around there, and he fell in love with his old grandma and wanted to marry her. Nonsense, brethren. Abraham said, Sarah, you're fair. She's the prettiest woman there was in the land. And that man with all them young women like that wouldn't have wanted that old great grandma with a little stick in her hand, a little shawl over her shoulder, a little dust cap on. You know he wouldn't want to take her for a wife. But God had turned her back to a beautiful young woman again, like he's going to do all the seed of Abraham someday. But so what's this? Oh, Jesus, that would be anyhow. Hallelujah. Doesn't mean a thing to the believer. Hallelujah. We can laugh in the face of this. One glorious day. My wife looked at me the other day. I was combing what hair I had. She said, honey, you're almost four-headed. I said, yes, but I haven't lost one of them. She said, you haven't? I said, no. She said, well, where are they at? I said, where was he before I got him? If you'll tell me where they were before I got him, they're out there waiting for me in the resurrection. Hallelujah! Every item, every thing that was told him was still out waiting. I've got the blessed old promise here, the Bible is power and cross, and the Holy Ghost confirming every word. Ready! Come, glorious day when he shall come. Let's do a 
if it wants to. It don't make any difference to me. Amen. I know in whom I have believed and I'm persuaded he's able to teach that I've committed to him against the day. Amen. Amen. Abraham straightened up on the sea. Abraham, a couple of mornings up, up, the Lord had met him there. I hear him say, Sarah, honey, why are your gray hair turning black again? And your little withered out brown eyes are becoming just as black and shiny again? Why, so I hear say, Abraham, your shoulders are straightened up, your beard is turning black again? And the first thing you know, there it was that sweet horse again. Exactly. Wish I had time to go a little farther in it. But just before you get along, I want to show you grace again, brethren. So this might kind of squeeze my Armenian brethren's toes just a little, but don't mean to do it, you see. But now, look here, but you might know truth. Now, Baptist, if you don't shout over this, I'm going to say you're backslid. Notice. What are you doing? As soon as they got down there to the rear, and Amalek looked out and said, Well, of all I waited for, there she is. Little grandma on it, huh? See, why well, couldn't have been, brother? And that's, that's silly to think such a thing. See, well, she was a beautiful young woman. He talked over there and put earrings in her ears and sits all up that night. Now, he was a very good holiness brother. Now, he went to bed that night and said his prayers and stretched his big feet out like that and thought, Oh, tomorrow I marry this beautiful girl. I've waited for her all my life, and there she is. Her brother's sitting out there in a tent. But he, he said that was his sister, and uh, she said that's my brother, so all oh, they're fishing all up, and tomorrow's the wedding. My, my. He goes off the and God appeared to him and said, you're just as good as a dead man. <laughs> brother. He said, well, what have I done? I'm just as, just as innocent as anything. He said, you got an old man's wife. Well, he said, well, Lord, you know the integrity of my heart. He said, didn't that man tell me that was his sister? Didn't she yourself to us, my brother? But I know the integrity of your heart. That's the reason I kept you from sinning against me. But if you don't restore her back, you're a dead man. Now look, a good boy, a good good fellow, but it's surely the sovereign grace of God, said, her husband is my prophet. Now I'll not hear your prayers, but you go back. My prophet... God told him not to leave Palestine, he left, he's vaccinated. Not only that, but he's sitting out there telling a lie. Saying a man's scared no more for his wife to do something like that. But he said, that's my prophet, take her back and restore her, and let him pay for you. That's scripture, brother. I know, that's, uh, where you at, that? What's the matter with you? That's right. There it was. Him backslid, running from God sitting out there, telling a lie. Now, they don't give you license to lie or anything. You remember that? We'll straighten that out in a few minutes. All right. God made him pay for it. But they were sitting out there in that condition, and God said, he's my prophet. Go take his wife back to him, and I'll let him pray for you, and I'll heal you. So he went out and did so. Abraham, when he became older, first thing you know, the little fellow was born, little Isaac, age about 12 years old, here he goes out. God met him again and said, Abraham, I know through this child you're to have be the father of the nation, but I tell you what I want you to do. I want you to take him out down to a mountain that I'll show you, and I want you to take him up there and offer him up for a sacrifice. Well, how is he going to be the father of nations, now about 115 years old, and here's the only child that he had, and take the little fellow out there and kill him? But you notice Abraham took the boy and some servants, didn't tell his mother. So they went four days' journey out into the wilderness. Now, an ordinary man can walk a good, I patrol for about seven years, walking 30 miles every day. And a man in them days didn't ride in automobiles like we ride today, so they could probably easily go 30 miles, or say 25 miles. Well, say, four days' journey, he'd be 100 miles back. And then he lifted up his head and saw the mountain fall off. And then when he got close to the mountain, watch, this is a sovereign great here. Watch him. He said to the servants, he said, now you stay here. While the lad and I go down to worship, and the lad and I will return. <laughs> oh, my. The lad and I, how are you going to do it? You're taking him up there to kill him. But how are you going to do it? It's not my business to figure it out with the Abraham. God gave the promise, and I received him as one from the dead, and God's able to raise him up from the dead. Amen. That's the children of Abraham. That's the hope they have in him tonight. So they took their little fella, 
Put the wood on his back, very type of Christ, where he hit just the high spots now. And he walked up the hill, and when he got up top of the hill, way up the top of the mountain there, when he's going to offer the sacrifice, little Isaac, he said, Father, said, here is the sa- here is the wood, and here is the altar, but where is the lamb, the sacrifice for the altar? And Abraham, a trembling voice, the old man, looked around to him and said, My son, God will provide for himself a sacrifice. He took his own son, bound his hands. Look, a double proof of our salvation tonight. God gave him a double. We don't have, God proved it twice through Abraham and swore to it with his own hand. That's right, that he'd keep this covenant. We don't have nothing to worry about. If God calls us into his loving grace, brother, I'm telling you, if you've ever been born again in the Spirit of God, you are to be the happiest person in the world. Because you have eternal life. Everlasting life cannot perish. Amen. You are soaked with the incorruptible seed of God. If the seed goes in the ground a grain of wheat, it can't not produce anything else but a grain of wheat. So if you go around and say, Well, praise the Lord, I, I've been saved, I've got the Holy Ghost, and living any kind of a life, you better get back to the altar of God again. Because the incorruptible seed of God cannot. Be one thing, you cannot be a wheat and a cockleberry at the same time. You've got to either be a wheat or a cockleberry. You all got cockleberries down here. All that like green bar around there, what you want to call it, some other weed, you see. You can't be a weed and a wheat at the same time. If you've got the spirit in you of the life of wheat, you'll produce wheat. If you've got the spirit in you of the life of a cockleberry, it'll be a cockleberry. And if the Holy Ghost is in you, you'll please God, love God, and act like a Christian. Right. If it isn't, you know them by the fruits they bear. Oh, what we need today is a good old time Holy Ghost revival. What we need today is an old time shaking again of the power of God, a moving of the mulberry bushes to go forward to battle again. God's giving the moving if people are just listen to it and believe it. Now, up on the mountain there, he took his own son, tied his hands behind him, laid him up on the altar, reached down and pulled out the knife, pulled the little fellow's throat back, and raised his hand to stab his own son to death. And about that time, the Holy Ghost caught his hand and said, Abraham! Lay your hand! Don't be scared to walk right down to the last roar of life with him. God will be there on the scene. He's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide a sacrifice. He will make a provision. And about that time, he heard something break, and there was a little ram hooked in the wilderness by his horn. Where did that ram come from? They was a hundred miles from civilization, and it was up on top of the mountain where there's no water. How did that ram get there? God is still Jehovah Jireh. No matter what the circumstances is, he can provide the sacrifice at any time. Amen. No matter what the circumstances in, he's Jehovah Jireh. Now look, it was a vision. He walked over and picked up the ram, laid it up on there, and stabbed it with the knife, and blood ran out of it. It was a vision. He saw it was actually a ram. It was Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundations of the world. Hallelujah. There he was. Christ was a vision. That lamb was spoken to existence in one minute and went out of existence in another minute. The same way that God made himself manifest in his flesh before Abraham and went out of existence in another minute. He's the same God that someday these atoms of ours will break and go out, life will grow out of this body, and he'll speak it back into existence someday in the resurrection. He's Jehovah Jireh. How will he do it? I don't know. That's his business, but he's telling you to do it, and I believe him. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice, no matter what it is. The lamb was there. He provided the lamb when it needed a lamb. When you're sick and you need healing, he'll provide for you. If you need salvation, he provides for you. If you need a revival, he'll provide for you. If the meal barrel's empty, he'll provide for you. Amen. If you're all down, hard, and drooped over, God will provide for you. For he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and cast our peace up on him with his stripes, and we were healed. Amen. The Lord's provided sacrifice. The Lord's provided lamb. Here not long ago, I was taking a little story on old blind Bartimaeus. 
He said that he was a blind man for years and years. He was doing the time of his married life while he was blind. He had a little girl born in the home. And the little girl had never seen her in his life. So one night, he used to sweat, he used to open the gates at Jericho and different places. He had two little turtle doves that done little tumbles like that, back and forth. They entertained the tourists that come by so they could give him a coin. He'd make his living. And a poor old fella, one night his wife got sick. He goes out and he prays. He said, Jehovah, if you only let her live, I promise you tomorrow I'll offer these two turtle doves for you for a sacrifice. And his wife got well and kept his word when I offered the turtle doves. Not long after that, his little girl got sick. And she was ready to die. The doctor would give her up. He went up and he said, Jehovah, if you only heal my little girl tomorrow, I only have one thing to give you. That's my lamb. And today they got dogs that lead the blind around. Them days they had lambs that led the blind around. So he said, I've got a lamb here that leads me where I'm blind. That's all I got. But if you'll just heal my little girl, I promise you I'll give you this lamb tomorrow. He went back in to fever with the little girl. The next morning he was on his road up to offer the lamb for a sacrifice. When he passed by, Cleopas is the great high priest of sound, said, Blind Bartimius, where goest thou this morning? It's a beautiful spring morning. So where are you going, blind Bartimius? He said, Oh, high priest. He said, I'm going up to the, the altar to offer this lamb. He said, uh, my girl was sick and God healed her and I promised I'd offer, give this lamb today. Oh, he said, blind Bartimius. He said, you can't offer that lamb, blind Bartimius. He said, I'll give you some money and you go buy a lamb. He said, oh, high priest, all oh, that's appreciated, but I never offered God a lamb. I offered him this lamb. And this is the lamb. God have mercy. The lamb. And he said, I offered him this lamb. I promised him this lamb. And he said, God, for genius, you cannot offer that lamb. That lamb is your eyes. He said, that is right, O high priest. But if I keep my promise to God, God will provide a lamb for blind Bartimus' eyes. He went on and kept his word to God. A one cold November day, sitting by the side of the gates of Jericho, shivering in his rags, with no turtle dove around. They heard a noise. Usually Jesus around was about a noise. They said, what's the matter? The Jesus of Nazareth comes by. He screamed, oh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. God had provided a lamb for blind Bartimus' eyes because he kept his promise to blind Bartimus. Let me say this tonight, my dear brother and sister, that same lamb that was provided for blind Bartimus' eyes is provided for yours tonight. For he was wounded for your transgressions, bruised for your iniquity. You say, can this be applied at this time? He's Jehovah Jireh. He will provide if you will believe. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee tonight for the provided Lamb. Praise the Lord for sinners slain, giving glory all ye people for his blood can wash away each pain. We're so thankful for that Lamb of God that was provided back there, come from the foundations of the world, all down through the ages, those draw remuneration from his great supreme sacrifice. And tonight, Lord, we pray that you let every blind man that's blind in sin and trespasses, walking around and stumbling in darkness, not knowing where he goes, may he tonight look to God, to the Lamb of God, and receive his spiritual sight at this time. Grant it, Heavenly Father, while we ask it in the name of the Lamb of God, thy beloved child, the Lord Jesus. While we have our heads bowed, I wonder if there be a sinner here tonight. Say, oh, God, pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. You make these other people happy. You give them security of their salvation. We see that when they're anchored in Christ, they feel so happy to go along like a little bunch of children out playing somewhere. Here, free love of you. Make me one of them tonight, O oh Lord God, all the Lamb of God is passing by God's provided sacrifice. I raise my hand to thee, Lord, and say, Be merciful to me, a sinner. 
Is there one in the audience anywhere would raise your hand? God bless you. Back there, brother. Bless you, brother. You, brother. You, 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 you. Oh, my up around in the rims above. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God bless you, my colored brother back there and all those along there, the whole group of you. The Lord bless you. Back up, way up back in the balcony there. Oh, Lord God, let that same lamb come this way tonight and save me for Christ's sake. Will you just raise your hand and say, Lord, I'm not putting up my hand to Brother Brandon, but I'm putting it up to you. Here's my hand, Lord. Don't let me die in my sins. I want to be saved. God bless you here in the wheelchair, sir. God bless you over here, my brother. God bless you here. Old, aged, gray-headed mother, trembling hands raised up. Sure, mother. God bless you back there, a young lady with her hands up. God bless you, a little girl. God bless you, this man here. God bless you over here. Oh, yes, my, he sees your hands. God bless you, young lady. The Lord be with you and bless you. God bless you, little boy. That's right. Everywhere now, God sees your hands. Anybody else? You said, does that help me, Brother Brandon? Put up your hand once and see how you feel. Just try it once. Right now, while the anointing of the Holy Ghost is on the meeting, taking the Word of God. God bless you, little boy. God bless you, Sonny. God bless you back there, sister. I see your hand. God sees it. If I don't, he sees it anyhow. You know, God bless you, sister, standing in the back. Someone else? Just before we pray, God bless you, honey, over there, the little girl. Anyone else? Someone wants to say, then, Lord, pass me not. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Would you raise your hands everywhere? Who are those who want the Holy Spirit? All right, God, be merciful. Now, while we pray, every Christian now join with us in prayer while we go to him to take these conditions to him. Now, to you who are outside of Christ, you know what made you raise your hand? God told you to. You couldn't do it unless the Holy Spirit told you. He said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all that comes to me, I will in no wise cast him out. Oh, what sovereign grace. Our Heavenly Father, you see every hand goes up for the needy condition tonight. Lost men and women, boys and girls, literally somewhat around 75 or 100, I guess. I pray, God, that not one of them will be lost. I know they won't. If they come sincerely, they raise their hand. They couldn't do it themselves. A human being is bashful. He's backward. He's like Adam was in the beginning. He's got a fallen nature. He'll run and hide from God. But not these. They heard your voice. They moved right out and raised up their hands. And here I am, Lord. Now you said, He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Oh, I'll give him everlasting life and we'll raise him up at the last day. Oh, merciful Father of life the only one who can give us life. And we know, Father, just as sure as a grain of corn will go in the ground without the germ of life in it, it'll never raise again. It'll rot and stay there. And as so is it with a Christian, Lord, or a man, if he goes into the ground, fall upon this earth without the Spirit of God, the way the tree leaves there to lay. Oh, God, I pray that this night that every one of them will have this hope anchored and sured in their heart that Jesus Christ forgives them of every sin right now that they have committed. While they're confessing their sins, Lord, may they find a real good church home here somewhere in their community and be faithful from here on. And every time that they start to do something wrong, may they imagine seeing that old blind beggar running forth to accept the Lamb. May everyone needing the Holy Ghost tonight, may their hearts be filled with our blessing, Lord. May he come like the rushing mighty wind before this night is over and chill every heart, Lord, and seal himself into the heart of every believer. And that little compartment in the heart called the soul. Grant it, Lord. May some glorious day we all meet there together. Bring the backslider in and every backslider had his hands up and remembered him or her tonight, Lord. Do it. And someday when life is all over, God, give me the privilege of sitting with them up there at your house. It's your throne. After we raise there, and you come down walking down to you and wipe all the tears away from our eyes. Say there's no more sorrow and no more tears. It's all over now. You're home. God grant that I can see every one of them there. May we all be joined together there around the throne when we sing Hosanna to the King and crown him Lord of Lords. Until then, Lord, may his spirit lead us and guide us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. God be merciful to every one of you. I believe that every man and woman, boy, girl, they put up their hands all over the audiences everywhere. Every one of you, I believe now, except Jesus Christ, you will never perish but God everlasting life.
What did Jesus say? Listen. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath present tense everlasting life and shall never come into condemnation but pass from death to life. I have to argue that with Christ. He is the one who said it. St. John, you ever want to raise your hand tonight? Read it when you go home. St. John 5, 24. Think of St. John and think of five, a handful, and two dozen eggs. 5, 24. St. John 5, 24. Jesus speaking, saying, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath, not will hath, hath right now everlasting life Amen. and shall never come into condemnation but pass from death unto life. Oh, my. If that wouldn't set souls afar, I don't know what it would. Amen. How we love him. How we appreciate him and adore him with all of our hearts. Now, can we have, it's not too late for you to Is it all right? I'm a little late. Tomorrow night, Brother Tom's or Brother Moore, one will be speaking. And I'll, and I'll come so we can start right into the meeting. I love you and thank you so much for giving me your attention, listening to me these nights that have had to come and struggle through this. But may the good Lord bless you abundantly. Let's pray now for the healing. Our Father, now after you save souls, I pray that we have found grace in your sight and that it's a night that you'll show your great mighty power among us now. I've tried to preach the best of the gospel that I know how, telling the people not to be scared. What we got to be scared about? God gave the promise. It's unconditional. We couldn't have come unless he drawed us, and all that come, he gave everlasting life, promised to raise us up at the last day. So there's nothing to be worried about, all upset. We're just walking along, having fellowship one with another, while the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Oh, how we thank thee for that, to know that there is a burning sacrifice, a bloody atonement, laying there on the mercy seat tonight, crying, Father, forgive them. And how thankful we are at the door of mercy still open. And now, Lord, I pray tonight that you will heal the sick. Thy servant can only pray for them, and that's what you asked us to do. You said, lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. You said, the things that I did, so will you, even greater, for I go to my Father. And we know that's true. Now, after hearing the word, the Holy Spirit moving in the church, may the great angel of God come and anoint your servant now, Lord. And maybe there's something in people's lives that should not be. Maybe they ought to have done some things that they did not do. Father, we pray that through your sovereign grace, if it is, that you'll make it known tonight so that the sons and daughters of man may become sons and daughters of God and get back into the right harness and serve thee all the days of their life. We ask it in thy beloved Son's name, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, if our sister or brother who plays the organ... Well, just give us a little part of only believe. My, what a wonderful time. Oh, this looks like it's just, everything so peaceful seems to me like. Around over here, just, there's something about souls coming to Christ. How I love to see people come to Christ. I'll tell you, to me, it's greater than divine healing to me. It really is, because it's eternal life to everyone that believes. Now, remember this now to every one. I ask you as a brother, if you'll just give me a few minutes, well, then we'll, we'll hurry right on. And custodians, we promise tomorrow night to be just a little quicker. I'm sorry to keep you long, but it, my, it's such a wonderful feeling to be. Uh, I don't do this very often out here. I don't have to because the managers speak it. But I will appreciate it if you'll be lenient with us, as this is our first time being together. And now to the sick and the needy. Now there's prayer cards to give out here everywhere. Uh, Billy, you, you give out prayer cards. And um, there's prayer cards out here, probably a hundred of them. And maybe, perhaps, tomorrow night or next night, we're going to gather them all up and start as soon as they come in and bring them all to and pray for them. And uh, uh, we're going to try to minister to every person that we possibly can while we're here. And remember, I'm not the one to pray for the sick, the only one. Your pastor is just as much ordained to pray for the sick as I or any other man in the earth. The Bible said, if there's any among you sick, call the elders of the church. 
And then he said, confess your faults one to the other, pray one for the other. The laity even can pray for each other. So healing doesn't lay in the man, it lays in Calvary. And any true gift of God will testify the same thing. That's right. Healing lays in Calvary, not in a man. That's right. Salvation all lays right in Calvary. Now, what was the no, uh, P? One to hundred? Well, let's take from the beginning, but get your prayer card. It's a little a little bitty thing like that. It's got my picture on it, and uh, it's got your, um, it's got a number on it, and uh, it's got a... Um, uh, the letter P, like in Paul, and it's um, and it runs from one to a hundred numbers on it. And let's see, let's let's just start from one then. Who has prayer card P number one? The lady there. All right, number two. Who has P number two? Would you raise your hand? Uh, put your hand up so I can see who you are, right quick, or say here I am or something. All right, two. Who has three? P number three, you lady, all right. Number four, who has P number four? Would you raise your hand somewhere? If they're up, way up in the balcony somewhere. Number four, way back, all right, lady, come on. All right, number five, who has P number five? Let's see your hand. That's over here, all right. Number five, come here, lady. All right, number six, P, look, it's a prayer card with a number letter P on it and it has number six. Is that person here? Raise your hand. Number six, do you have it, lady? Number seven, who has seven? Number seven, all right. Number eight, P, number eight, all right. Number nine, who has number nine? Which, number nine, all right, lady. Ten, who has prayer card P, number ten? You have it, lady? All right, ten. Let's see how we're getting lined up here now. Number ten, all right. See if they're all there, if you will. Number one to ten. All right. Let's get a few more. Number eleven. Who has eleven? All right. Number twelve. Twelve. Would you raise your hand? Is lady number thirteen? P thirteen. All right. Here fourteen. Who has P number fourteen? Would you raise your hand? Fourteen. Fifteen. Who has number fifteen? Would you raise your hand? This lady, is that number 15, lady? All right. Number 15. All right. Number... Number... Let's tell me how that's 15 of them. Let's try a few more. I believe we had about that many last night, didn't we? Let's try a few more. Who's got 16? 16? All right. 17. Number 17. You have it, lady? 18. Who has number 18? Is that the lady there? You have 18? All right, 19. Who has number 19? Would you raise your hand, someone? All right, number 20. Who has number 20? The man? All right. Let's see. I don't know as I get to them, but I'll, I'll try my best. Would you pray for me now? The Lord bless you. All right. While they're lining up back there and getting straightened out, now to you sitting here, some of you don't have prayer cards. I see a lady sitting here, a little baby covered over something. I see a lady laying on a top here, a stretcher. A couple of men in wheelchairs, a colored man laying out here on a stretcher. Look, my friends, you don't have to have a prayer card. You just have faith. You just give God a chance one time. Just have faith and believe Him and watch what will happen. All right. Let's sing together now with our hands up. Not only believe, but let's sing now I believe to the Lord. Now everybody together. Now I believe scriptures seeing uh, coming one morning a bunch of disciples there that had been given power to cast out devils and they had a boy there that had epileptic fits and they were trying to cast it out of him and they couldn't do it 
Now look, coming down the hill yonder, I see one, little age for his age, turning a little gray, walking quietly as he walked down. I can see them all run to him. This father, the boy, run to him and said, Lord, have mercy on my child. Said, I brought him to the disciples and seemed like they can't do nothing for him. Said, he he's, uh, has a bad spirit that throws him in the fire and makes him pine away and he frosts at the mouth and falls into the water. The devil trying to kill him. They call it epilepsy today, but then it was a devil. It's still a devil. And he said, and I took him to the disciples. They said, Lord, can you help me? Jesus turned around and said, I can if you believe, for all things are possible to them that believe. The father said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Oh, is that our cry tonight? Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Now, in this vast audience here, I realize that there's many peoples and many I don't know. Frankly, there's none that I know except my own associates that share with me. And this minister, I can't call his name, but he was with me the other day at the hotel. I, I, he's one of the chairmen of something of the committee. He's the only one that I know of. There's another minister with him, but I believe, but I don't know who the man was. Now, if Jesus, the Son of God, has raised from the dead, he will do the same things in his resurrection, if he is the same, that he did when he was here on earth. Is that right? When he was here on earth, he did not claim to be a healer. He said, I do nothing of myself. I'll, the Father shows me what to do, and then I go do it. I do what the Father shows me. Is that right? I do nothing of myself. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. The Father worketh, and I worketh hitherto. Now to make that plain to some of you new converts. Jesus said, I can't heal the sick. I can't do a thing. First the Father shows me a vision, and then I go act it out in drama and do just what he told me to do. Look at the grave of Lazarus. Look at all the places through the Bible. He did just as the Father showed him. He passed by the sick, afflicted, dead, died on every hands and everything. But when the Father showed him what to do, he went and done it. Now he said, the things that I do shall you do also. And a little while in the world, the unbeliever won't see me no more. Yet you shall see me. You will see me. He promised that he would be with us to the end of the age, the end of the world. The world hasn't come to the end yet. Jesus Christ, the Bible said in Hebrews 13, 8, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Is that right? Well, my contention is here in Georgia, as it has been three times around the world now, that Jesus raised from the dead and is alive tonight among man. And he's here in the same principle, same power, same signs, same wonders, working in his church, continuing the work with his church that he paid for while he was here on earth with his supreme sacrifice. I believe that with all my heart. I believe it because the Bible said so and because God comes and confirms it to be so. What do you think Jesus would do if he was here tonight? He'd be doing the same thing he did then. He looked out. There's a fellow named Philip. Got saved. This is for the newcomers. A fellow named Philip got saved. He went out and called his friend Nathaniel. He found him under a tree praying. Now listen close. So he said, Come see who I found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Why, the man was a very good church member, a real aristocratical sort of a fellow. He said, Could there come any good thing out of Nazareth? Is a mean little old city. Cutthroats and things there. there. He said, Come and see. That's a very good answer. Come and see. Well, he came. When he walked up, perhaps maybe as many people as standing here were standing around where our Lord was teaching. And when he was teaching the people, well, the first thing you know, uh, up come Philip walking along with Nathaniel with him. And Nathaniel looked over to see him. Jesus standing in the prayer line. He might have been in the prayer line. For him. Anyhow, he's in the presence of Jesus. And he looked over and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no God. Now, if I'd say it in the words today, I'd say, You're a Christian, honest man. Why, well, it astonished him. He said, Rabbi, when did you know me? 
Well, I said before Philip called you, when he was under the tree, I saw you. He said, Thou art the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. He said, Because I told you that you believe, you'll see greater things than this. Because then he just become a believer, you see. He could see greater things. And he did. And his name's immortal tonight. What did the educators and Pharisees and religious of that day say about him? They said, He's a fortune teller. He's Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And he cast out devils by the prince of the devils. Jesus said, Now if the devil cast out devils, and his kingdom is divided and can't stand. The devil cannot heal the sick. Someone caught me the other day on that day, called me up on the telephone, said, I'll differ with you. Said, look, when, Joel, when Moses and Aaron went on and said, those magicians done everything that Moses did, I said, whoop, wait a minute. The magicians could bring the curses, but they couldn't take them away. Healing lays in God alone. Amen. That's right. They could bring it. When balls broke out, they broke out too. <laughs> That's right. They could bring the curse, but they couldn't take it away because God, I am the Lord thy God that forgiveth all of thine iniquity, who healeth all of thy diseases. Comes through God alone. Now, I want you to remain seated. Now, in the, in the line there, the prayer line, I suppose I'm strange to each and every one. Is that right? If you are, raise your hand. If you all are strangers to me, raise your hand. How many out in this audience that doesn't have a prayer card and you want God to heal you tonight? Raise your hands, regardless. Or oh, just a solid mass, you see. I'll say this. If I have correctly represented Jesus Christ to you, and I claim that this is a divine gift sent from him, then if Jesus standing in a crowd and a woman touched his garment, and he looked out in the crowd and found her, if blind Bartimaeus and all that mass over there could be in such agony, Jesus couldn't hear him, of course. His distance is from here to the other end of the place, to iron thousands of people standing around. But his faith touched him. He said, Thy faith has made thee whole. See, thy faith. He looked upon the people, perceived their thoughts. The woman touched his garment, ran out into the audience. He looked around. See, he said, Somebody touched me. I got weak. Virtue went out. And he looked around over the audience, see who it was. Directly seen the little woman. He said, Now nah, your faith will you give your blood and you Stop. See? Because she believed. Now, if Jesus is alive tonight, making himself manifested in the spirit of man, he did even before the cross. That seems to be a hard thing for people to understand somehow. Before the cross, Jesus was in Moses. Jesus was in David. Jesus was in Joseph. Look at his life. Carried out just exactly portrayed the life, the life of Christ 2,000 years ago before he was born. See? And he's here after the cross. He died that he could come back and be among man. So he's among man tonight alive. How many believe it? God bless you. Now, of course, you know I'm talking, waiting for something. I'll tell you just what it is. <laughs> it's this person right here. The angel of the law. It's exactly the pillar of fire of the law. I'm just as you, a man. That's all. A born to sinner. Saved by grace, just like you. And many of you old-timers here tonight was back down there preaching you old Baptists and Methodists and Pentecostal and Nazarenes. I was back down there preaching when I was a little boy. I respect you, my brother. You've made the way. Hewed out the stumps and things so when these things come along they could run clear. I respect you and so does God. If there's any credit to be given at the day, I want to stand and see you get it. God bless you. Now, now his presence is here. Now in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I take every spirit here under my control. Now listen, be quiet. Don't move around. Just sit still. Pray. Be in prayer. Look this away. You without prayer cards. And you with prayer cards, when you come here, if he goes to speaking to you, don't say no. Just wait. Let him get through talking. Then you know whether it's truth or not. See what he tells you to do. Sometimes when you break up, then you break the vision, you see. And that, that stops me. Because I hear you talking back here, and then here you are as a little girl or a little boy talking. Uh, and that, that brings me out of the vision. Just let him get through talking to hear me ask you. And then the vision's over. Okay. Now be reverent everywhere. Uh, is this the lady? 
Uh, if you will, and someone watch time, and Brother Wood, you watch real close tonight if you can. Don't let me stay too long. And But let me stay as long as possible. Now, everybody real reverent and be in prayer. Now, you can imagine my position standing here before this, I suppose, 3,000 people right on it, maybe more, and standing here to this woman, a stranger. Would you like to walk up and take the place before the audience? And, Neither would I, but I'm depending on him, the Lord Jesus, who promised that I'll be with you, and he has been to this time, and I believe he will, and will help me now, because I believe him, and I trust him, and I, I believe that he will do it. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, surely will help us tonight. And let's just keep in prayer as we talk, believe on the Lord with all of our hearts. And I trust that the Lord Jesus will bring these things to pass, each one. All right, sister. Now, just a little talk with you. Now, the first thing I see you, of course, you're wearing glasses, you see. But now, being that you're the first patient here, are we strange to each other? We don't know each other. Our first time meeting in life. If so, the people know that, would you just raise your hand so that they'll know we not no way at all I ever know you. You're you're a perfect stranger to me. <clears throat> but God has known you since you were born and before you were born. He's known me the same way. Now, if I was a if you need healing of your body, I don't know. But if you do, see, if I could do it, I would. If I wouldn't, I'd be a brute. <laughs> see, if I could do it and wouldn't do it. But I can't do it because it isn't in man to do it. It's God. God's mercy. Now, if he will let me know, just like you and I talking like the woman at the well of Samaria talked to the Lord Jesus, he talked to her just long enough to get a conversation to strike her spirit. And that's why I'm doing the same thing. Just to know. And if he will reveal to me what you're here for, will you accept it as his presence and him doing it? And we'll believe then. You'll accept it if it's if it's for finances. You believe you'll get it if it's for a salvation. You believe you'll get it if it's a, whatever you're asking. You believe you'll get it. if God will reveal it to me what you're here for. Then it shows He knows what you want. Will the rest of you all do the same? Believe with all your heart, or just believe? Now, as I look to you, as Peter and John said at the gate, called beautiful to the crippled man, look on us. See. Of course, he was trying to see, perhaps the vision struck as it does for all things, showed him that the man could walk, and he just picked him up, because he knew he could walk, after he seen the vision that he could walk. Now, to you, your trouble, you've got a hurting in your back. It's in your back where your trouble is. Then also, you've had an examination of some sort. And it's a growth on your spine. You have a growth on your spine. Then I see him looking at your wrist. You've got a growth on your, your right wrist, right above the little knot. You can't see it here, but it's there anyhow. That is true. Then you're not from here. I see you come from the south this way, and you're passing a street walking. It's got a lot of great big palm trees, and you're by a seashore. Or you live in a city where the sea rolls in and out like this, and it's a, it looks like art to know. It's Flagler Street. It, you're from Miami. That's where you're from. That's right. You are. I go back home and be well. Jesus Christ to make you well in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. Believe. You shall have what you ask for if you can only believe. Now, oh, if I could only my audience would only know what a feeling that, that puts on me. I just feel like I'm shaking to pieces right now, I see. It's because of that woman's healing. And now, it just seems like a stream from out in there just pouring every way. What is it? You're conscious now that something's here besides me. See? And your spirit, see, it isn't me that does this. You're the one who does it. See, the woman, it wasn't Jesus healed the woman. The woman caught this, pulled it through Jesus. It's God's gift, but your faith is pulling God's gift. See, God can use his gift or you can use it. 
Now, to this woman standing here, I suppose we're strangers to one another, lady. Well, God knows you doesn't. I don't. But if God will reveal to me, just for his glory, which you know that he receives all the glory, for man cannot do those things. Now, if he will reveal to me what, what, you're, what you're here for, will you believe it and accept that you believe that you'll get what you ask for? some contact with somebody else, you, are, you suffer with a, a trouble that upsets your stomach, but it's under your right side, which is a gallbladder. You have gallbladder trouble. And um, you have, a, I believe it's a blood condition, diabetes also. You have a sugar diabetes. Now, I see someone standing near you. You, it's a, it's a, it's a young man, kind of husky. It, it's, it's your son. He's a preacher, yes. and he's, a, he, he's with somebody that's got a, a wearing shawls or something. Other, it's got a, a D. No, it's four square. A four square preacher, and he's a kind of a husky fella, and he's red headed. That's right. Go home. You have what you asked for. Your faith makes you well. Amen. Come. You believe? God bless you, lady. We're strangers to each other. Of course, I can see your trouble. It's just placed on your nose. Now you look to me just a moment. Maybe seeing that's your trouble. Maybe God will tell me something else that you can see. Anyone can see that, you see. Like if you go out here and say, this man sitting here is crippled in a wheelchair. Anybody sees that. This man here on the stretcher, this man here, sure, anybody sees that. But the thing is somebody looks well, and then the mysterious part is what about them? That's the part. Now you look to me as you realize that something come over you then. That was the spirit of the law. <laughs> now, that is a growth that you're afraid of being a cancer. Okay. And that was caused, you got it hurt. You hurt your nose some time ago. And it's been coming like that, growing up to this place. And somehow or another, between you and I, there comes great rolling waves, like water rolling. And you're leaving or going to some, it's a, it's a sea. You're a missionary. And you're from, a, I believe it's Bermuda Islands or some of that, in one of those places where off of a, a bo- yes, where you're, and you're trying to go back, aren't you? Yeah. God bless you. Yeah. Have faith in God. Believe. Lady, are we strangers to each other? We are strangers to each other. I don't know you, but God knows you. Now, quickly, I begin to see like a little dark shadow moving. And it's a a wearisome spirit causing you to be nervous. You get real nervous, don't you? You have a nervous condition, especially I see you in a kind of a late of an afternoon like that you get your most nervousness sometimes you sit down from your work that's right then you have something wrong in your back kidney trouble it's in your back then you've got you're wearing your glasses and that's from weak eyes and that was caused from some kind of a something that happened like a i'd say smallpox or something settled in your eyes long ago that is true you believe you're in his presence? Yes, sir. You believe that that's him speaking through me? 
That wasn't my voice then. That was his. Now this is mine. You believe then if he's that president and lay hands on you, what he say would happen? They shall recover. Is that right? Come here. This I do in obedience to the commandments of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that this woman be healed. Amen. God bless you, sister. Go rejoicing now. And God be merciful and bless you. How do you do, lady? You believe with all your heart? We are be strangers to each other, I suppose. Off You won't get healed of that throat trouble? You was healed then. Jesus Christ made you well, lady. Amen. Amen. See, you don't need your prayer cards. You don't have to have them. You just have to have faith in, in God. Just look this way and believe that I've told you the truth. See, that's all I ask you to do. Well, he was sitting there praying. And she was praying, saying, Lord, let the man turn around and call me and I'll accept it. If that's right, lady, wave your hand. Raise up your hand and wave. See, just quoting your prayer to you. See? In this dimension, you're not in this world. You're somewhere else. See? Oh, isn't he wonderful? He's raised from the dead. Let's just say praise be to the living God, the great Jehovah. He's not left his people without a witness. He's come to us in this day, and we worship him and praise him with all of our hearts. Amen. Now, look this way just a moment, lady, that I might be able to say something to you. Perhaps that would help you. I hope so. It'll have to come through God. You know that. I see you. You've been to a doctor. And a doctor was examining a left eye. And it was in some sort of a place like a... Uh, no. This is a... Yes, now wait. There's another vision moving into my... They're far back behind this. You was in a place where they operated or burnt something or another. Burn a growth off your eye. And then it's come back again, and this doctor tells you it has to be cut out now. That's the truth. You believe that Jesus will let you get well? Come here. Almighty God, in the name of him who sees between us, God, be merciful to the woman. May she be well and live a long life. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. God bless you, lady. Go now and be healed. Have faith. Don't doubt. You believe, lady? Now, we're strangers to one another. But there's one thing that sure God knows us both, doesn't he? You are suffering with a hideous thing. It's called cancer. And there's a death spirit lingering near you. And one thing you need worse than that is salvation to the soul. That's right. Will you accept Jesus as your Savior now? You're a sinner. If you will repent now and give your life to Christ, Christ will heal you. Do you give him your life? Almighty God, her sins be forgiven her. And I pray, God, that you will take every sin away and heal her tonight and make her well. I condemn the devil that's bound this woman. Come out of her in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, little lady. You've tried hard. You know you've been condemned. Yes. On your robe to here, you was yes. praying yes. that God would do something for you. Yes. You was ready to repent. Is that yes, right? Sir, really and your yes. sins are forgiven now. Yes. Go on your road rejoicing and serve the Lord Jesus. Yes. Amen. Oh, I didn't read the woman's mind. I'm not. This woman here, lady, lay your hand over on my uh, hand just a minute. I won't look her in the face. I, if God will reveal to me what's wrong with you standing here like this, never looking at you, will you believe that Jesus sent me? Will you do it, lady? You have diabetes. Jesus Christ make you well. Is that right? Go on your road rejoicing. You don't have to do that. Just 
Kate, let me have your hand a moment, lady. God. Yeah, I see you trying to get out of a bed, lady. You're stiffening your body. It's arthritis. Is that right? Go off the platform. Jesus heals you. Makes you well. Come, will you, lady? Just a moment. Where's the colored people? It's you. On the cot. Do you believe me as God's prophet? You have no prayer card, do you? You believe that God can tell me what's wrong with you? Will you accept me as his prophet and obey me? Then get up from the cot and go home and eat your supper. Jesus Christ will make you well. Amen. Lady, you believe that God heals you of diabetes? Go on your road rejoicing and be made well. Jesus Christ heals you. Amen. Let's say praise be to the living God. Let us say praise be to God. All right, sisters, you believe Jesus make you well. Believe with all your heart. Jesus Christ healed you. Go on your road and rejoice in sin. Thanks be to God. Sir, what if I told you he'll stand there in the line? Would you believe me? Yes, sir. You are, my dear brother. Go on the road and be happy and rejoice. Come. Yeah, believe, lady. Go eat your supper. Jesus Christ heals you in your stomach trouble now. You go be made well. You believe. Come, lady. You believe with all your heart? You believe me to be God's servant? The kidney trouble leaves you then. Go on your road rejoicing and your back's made well. You go and be made well in Jesus' name. Come. Watch, you believe? Just a moment. You believe me, lady? Look at this foul black streak coming across this way. Can't you see it? Here it is. It's them two women sitting right back on that second row. Both of you are suffering with female trouble. Ladies' trouble. That's right. You have the same thing. All three of you stand up. Jesus Christ heals all three of you. There goes the streak away from you. Go on your road rejoicing. Be made well. Have faith in God. The lady sitting right back there is back trouble. Do you believe Jesus Christ makes you well? you believe it with all your heart? If you do, you can receive it. God bless you. Go home and be made well if you can believe. Amen. You don't get rid of that hay fever? you believe that God will make you well? You do? All right, He heals you. Lay your hand on that lady next to you there. She has heart trouble. Let's see if she gets healed too. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'll bless her also and make her well. Amen. You know the reason she was healed? Lady, you with the baby. That heart trouble you've been having, this lady here had heart trouble too. You was both healed at the same time. So you can go home and be made well. God bless you. And now you had the same thing. It left you at the same time it left from her. There's that triune hookup right like that. You're healed. Go home rejoicing and be made well. Hallelujah. You believe. Have faith in God. Your arthritis is gone. Go home. Amen. You don't get all that flea bite us sitting back there? You believe that God makes you well? Your faith heals you, this then, lady. Rise to your feet. Jesus Christ makes you well. Come, lady. The anemic condition is gone also, so you can go on your road rejoicing. Come. Amen. Just a minute, just a minute. I can't get my breath on. You believe? Aren't your female troubles gone from you? 
Have faith. Is this one the patient? Are you the patient, sir? You believe? Yes, I believe. You believe on me as God's prophet? Yes, I, do. Yes. I believe you're telling the truth. You've been hurt. You've been struck with a piece of steel or metal, and you've had a brain operation. I see something <laughs> like trains or railroads. You were yes. said you had an operation. You're a Catholic also by faith. You're a yes, Catholic. And you're... Your name is Davis. Your first name's Walter. You live at 909 2nd Street. Go home, sir. Serve the Lord Jesus. He makes you well. Jesus Christ grant it to you. Why don't you get up and take all of our trouble laying on that cot, lady? Rise up in the name of the Lord Jesus. May the Holy Ghost...